Okay, so our next speaker is uh, is is Kwon Tak Cho from uh, University of Michigan. Uh, the title of the paper is "The Error Handling of In Vehicle Networks uh, Makes Them Vulnerable." Okay, let's welcome our speaker. Okay, uh, thank you all for attending the talk. Um, today I'll be talking about error, error handling of in vehicle networks making them vulnerable. Uh, my name is Kyung Tak Cho, and this work has been done with my advisor Kang Shin from the University of Michigan. So, before going into the details about the attack that we have proposed in this paper, uh, we'd like to provide some background on automotive security. Uh, as many of you may know, uh, vehicles were composed of mechanical parts, but now they are being replaced with um, electronic parts. On top of that, uh, wireless connectivities are added onto uh, those vehicles. Uh, of course, these have uh, provided efficiency and controllability, but at the same time, they've also opened up remote access points for um, attackers to actually access the in-vehicle network and even control the vehicle itself. Of course, this is a security risk. So there were a lot of attacks that have been demonstrated out there uh, by a lot of researchers. And to defend against these attacks, um, there have been mainly two uh, streams of defenses. So uh, first is the authentication methods. So they are trying to uh, add message authentication codes to in vehicle network messages, use those for the purpose of authentication. And the other way would be just installing an intrusion detection system and trying to see whether there are any intrusions in the in-vehicle network or not. So in, in such a case, um, we can prevent or detect the attacks, but uh, in this paper, we would like to bring up this question on whether there are any new types of attacks that may bypass the existing defense schemes or might confuse them. So in CAN, which is a de facto standard for in-vehicle networks, um, ECUs, which are basically just computers in your cars controlling, controlling them, they uh, broadcast messages periodically, which contain information about their sensors, such as um, wheel speed, uh, uh, steering angle, and so forth. And each ECUs, when they uh, transmit their data, they actually monitor whether the transmit bit is actually same to the one that is reflected on the bus. So they verify this whenever they transmit the message. And if it's not the same, they, uh, it is specified in the CAM protocol to incur something called a bit error. A bit error does not incur in a stage called arbitration, which we detail later. But if this uh, error actually incurs, uh, two of their error counters actually are adjust, adjusted. So they have two error counters, uh, such as uh, transmit error count and receive error count. So what these error counters do for uh, each ECUs or their CAN controllers, uh, if during tra transmission or reception of a message, uh, if they experience an error, the transmit error count is increased by eight. Whereas the res uh, during reception, if an error incurs, um, the error count is only increased by one. On the other hand, uh, if the ECU succeeds in sending their message or receiving their message, their transmit error count TC or their receive error count REC are decreased by one. So with these two error counts, they manage their error states. So first, every ECU in the in-vehicle network starts in their default mode as an error active. If either of those error counts exceed a value of 127 because of continuous uh, errors, they go enter a state called error passive. Otherwise, uh, if they succeed in transmissions or receptions, and if uh, those two error counts are lower than 127, they go back to their default mode of error active. However, uh, if those ECUs keep on inc incurring problems on the in-vehicle network, that is, incurring bit errors by themselves, um, their TEC actually, ex if they exceed 20, one, uh, 255, uh, the ECU gets discon uh, disconnected from the bus. Or even uh, it is said that some vehicle manufacturers design their ECU so that whenever even one ECU enters this bus off state, the whole vehicle is just shut down. So they can, of course, recover back to their default uh, state called, uh, to error active either automatically or manually. But this really depends on how the vehicle manufacturers design their software. So, um, in this 
paper, uh, we're actually using this error handling scheme as an effect attack vector. So our error handling scheme has been very promising, very powerful in providing fault tolerance and reliability in in-vehicle communications for many years. But if you look in terms, uh, in the view of an attacker, actually the attacker can use this error handling scheme in order to shut down an uncompromised and or some any un uh, any healthy in-vehicle ECU. So that is our objective, and we call that attack boss-off attack. The required, um, required capabilities for the attackers are it has to inject the message, but also sniff messages in order to see what messages that it can target. But of course, because CAN uh, networks is basically a broadcast bus, once compromised, you can read off any message from your in-vehicle network. Previous attacks actually had some requirements in trying to uh, in reverse engineering messages or their checksums. That is, they had to understand what this message ID meant and use those in actually controlling the vehicle. Or they had to understand how the checksums are implemented. However, in this attack, because we're proposing some kind of a DDoS attack, uh, they, uh, this boss of attack doesn't require those things, which obviously is less painstaking and also it lowers the technical barrier of the attacker in mounting this. So what the attacker does, it injects the message at the right timing with a very well-crafted message. And if it matches that timing, the actual transmit error count of the victim increases. So that means what, if you have just one compromised ECU, you can shut down any ECU on your bus by just performing this attack. If it iterates that, that victim ECU's error count would eventually go over the limit of 255 and enter the bus off state. So we'll look in a bit more detail on how this is performed. Um, usually in the arbitration phase that I mentioned before, uh, this phase is for resolving contention. So say if node A and B um, had to say, send a message at the same time. Um, during that uh, phase, whenever a node sees an opposite bit on the bus right, uh, compared to what it had transmitted, it acknowledges that someone else who has higher priority is sending on the bus. So what it does, it, after it loses arbitration, it switches to receive mode and just lets the high priority message be sent on the bus. On the other hand, in this boss off attack, what the attacker does is it tries to inject its message with the same ID as the victims. Then what happens is that, in contrast to uh, the previous case, that is the uncompromised case, where we had only one arbitration winner, now we have two. So after that, what the adversary also uh, does is it crafts its message in, or, uh, in order to make a collision in the victim side. So if, say, example, in the control field, uh, if it puts all zeros in it, then the victim would see an opposite bit on the bus. And because it's after the arbitration phase, it would experience a bit error. So in, accordingly, the transmit error count of the victim is increased by eight. And if the adversary iterates this process, it can actually make the uh, victim issue think that it is erroneous, whereas it is actually under attack. Because normally, uh, transmit error counts only e are increased when they are in an erroneous state. So eventually, the adversary can force that victim to enter the boss off state and then shut down that issue. Or as I said, depending on the vehicle, you can shut down the whole network suddenly. So looking at uh, the, uh, looking at the boss off attack, in two different phases. In phase one, as I said, um, with the same uh, transmission timing and well-crafted message, it can incur a bit error at the victim side. But looking in more detail at, w at what, what actually happens in such a case, the victims transmit something called an error flag. And if it's in an error active mode, it sends an error flag of uh, six zeros. So in this case, the adversary also experiences a uh, bit error or stuff error, which I didn't really detail. And it also increases its TEC by eight. So here you can see that uh, the adversary and the victim both has a TEC of eight. But the interesting thing here is that CAN controllers are designed to actually retransmit their error, mess error experience message as soon as the bus becomes idle. So you can see that they do the same thing again. So on and on, 
what, what this controller does for the attacker is the attacker just injects one message, but in fact, it goes up to 128 suddenly because the CAN controller is doing every retransmission automatically as specified. And in the next phase, it becomes a bit, little bit different from the previous one. So because both nodes have TC of 128, they are both in error passive mode, not error active mode. So in such a case, what is, what, what is different is that um, error passive uh, nodes actually transmit an error flag, but in a different way of having passive flags. So that's six ones. In such a case, uh, this doesn't really incur bit errors on the bus, so which makes the adversary succeed in its transmission. And after that, that is only when the victim actually succeeds in its transmission. And one interesting thing here also to capture is that even though um, the adversary has recovered back to its initial state of error active, the victim has uh, is still remained in error passive. The reason being, CAN is designed to increase its error when it, uh, error count when it has error by eight, but if it's error free, decrease only by one. So we have a net increase of plus seven on the victim side. The attacker can iterate this process and then keep on increasing the victim's uh, transmit error count, eventually shutting that node down. Another interesting thing that I would like to um, capture here is that people are trying to uh, in, like install message authentication codes or use checksums for some reliability or security. But uh, all of this error occurrence is done during transmission or reception, which means even before some node tries to verify their Mac or tries to verify their checksum, the errors are incurred and the attacker can succeed in this attack no matter what. So there are three important things that needs to be satisfied in order to achieve this boss off attack. First, as I said, it has to have the same ID. Also, it has, the content should be well crafted to have uh, one bit that is zero, whereas the victim is one, and all precedent bits being equivalent. And finally, and most importantly, there should be a synchronization between the transmission timing of the victims and also the adversaries. So if the attacker satisfies all three of these factors, then it can succeed in boss off attack. We'll first talk about the two that is pretty much easy for the attacker to achieve. For achieving um, the first condition of having the same ID, as I have said, because CAN is a broadcast bus, it can just monitor the bus, look at the IDs that it would like to target, and just use that ID when it injects its message. The next is um, having different contents. So as I said, although all the preceding bits should be the same, only one bit of the adversary should be zero, whereas the victim should be one. The most easiest way to achieve this is having a data length code of zero. Data length code uh, defines what length this message has. So normally in vehicles, this DLC is a has a value larger than zero. But if the attacker just writes that DLC part with all zeros, then it can definitely um, satisfy the second condition. The last condition of synchronizing the transmissions um, between the attacker and the victim is the most difficult part. So if it is synchronized, uh, the attacker can actually incur transmit error on the victim side. But otherwise, if it's not synchronized, uh, because the bus is busy when the attacker is trying to transmit its message, because of how CAM works, it gets delayed afterwards until the actual uh, victim finishes its uh, transmission and the bus becomes idle again. So the question would be how to synchronize the transmission timing between the attacker and the victim. One can think of a way of exploiting periodicities. So because in vehicle networks, um, messages are sent periodically, say for example, every 10 milliseconds, uh, the, vic uh, the attacker can observe, um, say, message ID 0x01 is, is sent every 10 milliseconds. We should send it after the, uh, 10 milliseconds after we receive that. But the problem is there are jitters in how um, the timing of their injection. So this makes it quite unpredictable on when it would be sent. And also, because the synchronization requires a one-bit resolution, which is, say, for in normal vehicles, it's a two microsecond uh, time, 
is it very hard to achieve it in this way. So what we proposed in this paper is to use something called preceded ID. So um, we exploit the following fact. Um, in CAN, nodes uh, which have lost arbitration or had messages buffered while someone else was transmitting, it starts its transmission whenever, uh, as soon as the bus becomes idle again. So what exactly is preceded ID? So I'll give you an example here. Um, first, say node A has a message M1 uh, buffered in it, and it can immediately transmit it because the bus is idle. But say M2 and M3 is also buffered in node A and B at a similar time. That is while M1 is being transmitted on the bus. In such a case, both will try uh, contend to each other to transmit on the bus, but if the priority of M1 is high, uh, M2 is higher than M3, uh, node B loses arbitration and it has to wait another round. So M2 is sent and then finally node B can transmit its message. And you can see here that um, although the messages were uh, injected at some, some kind of random timing, it becomes a kind of a bit more determinative. That is, after the IFS, that is into frame space, the message always comes after some message. So we define preceded ID of message M as uh, the ID of message that has completed its uh, transmission right before the start of M. So in this case, um, M1 would be the preceded ID of M2, and M2 would be the preceded ID of M3. So how can the attacker exploit such um, a preceded ID? For the same example here, um, the, what the adversary can do is that if it analyzes the network traffic, it will have some idea that M3 would always come after M2, and also M2 is always coming after M1. So once seeing M1 or M2, it can inject its message and synchronize the timing with the victims and incur the bit error at the victim side. So learning preceded ID is essential and also the existence of it. And also because the timing is pretty determinative, it, this, uh, the success accuracy is pretty high for this case. So the next question that we answered was, how many preceded IDs do we have in real vehicles? Or can we fabricate them so that the attacker can easily delay messages of the victims and synchronize its timing? So we actually analyzed the CAN bus log data um, that was provided by University of Tulsa. They logged uh, the 2010 Toyota Camry's CAN bus for, during a 30 minute drive. And what was interesting to see in real cars was that for certain messages, uh, they ha always had a unique preceded ID to it. The reason being this is that um, vehicle manufacturers uh, tend to uh, schedule their messages to send, say, two messages at the same time. For example, if you want to send your uh, rear uh, wheel speed and also your front wheel speed, those are composed into two different messages, but the same ECU sends it at the same time, which means one of those messages is always the preceded ID of the other. Another interesting thing that we found out is that we can extract some patterns in these preceded IDs. So for this uh, message 223, for, the, for every 2 nth transmission of 223, the preceded ID message of this was 23. So for every second message of it, we can look at the, uh, its preceded ID and try to synchronize the transmission timing. Another question is, can the attacker actually fabricate this? That is, because the attacker actually has a rough estimation on when the victim will transmit its next message, although not really exactly, what it can do is right before that timing, it can inject a fabricated preceded ID message, make the victim's message get delayed because the bus will be busy, and then synchronize its timing. We also, uh, analyze the feasibility of such an attack in, uh, in such a way in terms of three different factors, timing, quantity, and contents. Although we do not really go into detail, it uh, showed that with just one fabricated preceded ID message, the attacker can achieve the boss off attack. So we did evaluations in two different settings. First, we had a CAN node prototype. The CAN node prototype consists of CAN nodes um, which has a CAN shield that provides a CAN 
uh, protocol, and also an Arduino Uno that is a microcontroller. The other was, uh, we ex examined this boss off attack in two different vehicles, a 2013 Honda Accord and a 2016 uh, Hyundai Sonata. So this is how the, our prototype looked like. We programmed each as a victim, adversary, and a non-victim to monitor how uh, the messages were sent. So this is the interesting uh, part for this attack. As I had discussed in phase one, uh, with just one attack message from the attacker, both of the victims and the adversary's transmit error count soars up to 128. Within, for this case, it was just achieved within two milliseconds. If the attacker iterates this attack, the victim can, uh, would enter boss off state, whereas the attacker would recover back to his error active state. Looking closely, we've we found out exactly what we had expected. We saw that there was a plus eight increase, but also a minus one decrease right after that. But, all, but still, there was a plus seven increase, so the victim was eventually entering the boss off state. We also examined whether uh, which um, approach is the most efficient one. So just looking at periodicity, it didn't really work. The accuracy was very low. But if we assume the genuine preceding ID, the accuracy was 100% in achieving this boss off attack. Even when we fabricated that, the accuracy was 90% and eventually made the victim boss off as well. So then the next interesting part is the attack on real vehicles. So we actually connected our prototype nodes to the vehicle network through the OBD2 port. And we were able to read off every message, but also inject it. I would like to note that to evaluate this, we used uh, this characteristic that in phase one, if it succeeds, the victim's TC is exactly the same as adversary TC. So if we looked at the adversary TC, we knew that this boss self attack was working on the real, uh, real ECU on the vehicle. So this is how it showed it for both cases. So in both cars, we found, we found out with a high accuracy that the in-vehicle ECU was actually uh, suffering from this boss off attack. And we also some, saw some warning lamps after we iterated this, but we didn't have a way to show that, so we actually evaluated it in such a way. If we assume that the prototype node that was connected to the real in-vehicle was the victim, we still managed to see that the victim suffers from this attack. Finally, the countermeasure would be um, we actually exploit uh, two characteristics of boss off attack. In phase one, uh, due to the CAN's uh, auto, uh, automatic transmission, we already know that there will be two consecutive errors incurring in a very short time. And also in phase two, when the victim actually uh, ha suffers from the boss off attack, meaning its TC is increased, uh, the actual uh, adversary succeeds in transmitting its attack message. So if we look at that, we know there's some ID being transmitted while my TC is increased. So we simulated the probability of F1 under uncompromised conditions. Even for a high uh, bit error rate uh, in, in vehicle networks, for example, 10 to the minus three, whereas normally it's 10 to the minus five to 10 to the minus seven, the probability of F1 as expected was uh, near zero. Whereas during boss of attack, it, the probability is one. So we use this discrepancy in actually getting the um, indication of a boss of attack. Why we say indication is that um, this can happen if the transceiver itself has uh, bit flips or bit drops. So to get the evidence, we use the second factor. Uh, if we look at the uh, network, we can see that some message is being sent while my TC is being increased. So we propose a countermeasure to use these two facts to reset the ECU. So whenever uh, F2 was observed right after F1, we made that ECU reset, and this is how uh, the TC showed with the countermeasure. Of course, the best countermeasure would be redesigning the CAN or redesigning the transceivers, but obviously you, you already know that's very hard. So this is how we um, approached in defending against this boss of attack. And finally, uh, we also looked at how vulnerable other uh, in-vehicle networks might be. Uh, CAN-FD is the, an enhanced version of CAN. It's starting to be used for high-speed communication, but it resembles pretty much all of CAN. 
And also the interesting thing, it uh, has two bits that indicates whether this message is safety critical or not. Meaning, if the attacker observes those two bits, it can just target the ones, uh, ECUs that are safety critical. TTCAN is another CAN protocol uh, that also provides timing information. So in this case, the attacker doesn't really have to go through synchronizing everything, knowing what to learn. It can just use the, the, the scheduled map and then use that for injecting messages. And finally, there's FlexRay. But because that had a different error mode management, um, it's not really vulnerable to this bus of attack. So to conclude the talk today, um, we have pro uh, proposed a uh, attack method that exploits the CAN error handling scheme, which has been known uh, for its fault tolerance, but in fact, it has been used as an attack vector. We have shown uh, that this works on a CAN bus prototype as well as on real vehicles. And we proposed a countermeasure against the bus of attack, but I, I would really like to have uh, vehicle manufacturers investing more in redesigning things so that this can be defended properly. Thank you. Thank you, very impressive talk. Any questions from the audience? Hi, uh, I'm Shai Wolf from Tel Aviv University. Um, so, uh, two things. First, you demonstrated this as basically a denial of service. Um, and the, the way you, see, you spent a lot of time work, worrying about uh, the resynchronization. Re um, have you thought about uh, synchronizing by flooding the bus uh, with a very high rate of messages, forcing additional collisions uh, right after the synchronization? Uh, yes, that's a very good question, but uh, our objective here was to minimize the number of injections because we, we wanted to bypass existing, say, intrusion detection systems. So if you look at the frequency, if it's very high, you can easily see that something wrong is happening, that, say, an attack is mounted. But what we tried to do was we wanted to minimize that number of injections so as to bypass, say, schemes that have been implemented out there. So that was the main purpose of trying to synchronize the timing as much as possible. Okay, and <clears throat> the second thing is not a question, but a, a comment. Um, so we, we've actually done pretty much exactly the same thing that you've described in the first half of your, your work. Uh, it's going to be published in uh, SCAR next month. Okay. Um, but we use this pretty much the same phenomenon uh, as a defense mechanism. Oh. To, to shut off an adversary that's misbehaving. Oh. So actually using the same type of phenomena to turn off an ECU that's misbehaving because an adversary is installed on it. Oh, yeah, that's a very interesting aspect. So yes, that's right. We could talk about this later. Sure, sure, sure. <laughs> Thank you. So, Paulo Verissimo, University of Luxembourg. I mean, this was a great talk, very clear. Thank you. Um, my doubt is the following. Uh, if Am I right in assuming your threat model is that you can put a rogue ECU into the car because that's, that's your device? A rogue ECU. So, An ECU that you made yourself, or an external ECU. That's your threat model, right? Um, actually, all of the uh, remote, exploits, remote exploits can lead to message injection capability for the attacker. So in this case, um, as I said, all the attacker has to do is just be capable of injecting and reading off, which can be also done remotely as well. So right, but then, you know, let me ask you this. Uh, I, if I, correct me if I'm wrong, you know, some of the stuff you presented implies violations of the protocol. True, right? true. So you cannot just, you know, take over an ECU and change the VLSI of uh, the CAN control. So, actually, Actually, every th why we did this with an Arduino and with a CAN shield is that we just wanted to uh, read, uh, just program the software, and everything was done according to the CAN protocol. So, say if we just schedule the message to be injected at some timing, that's all we did. But every transmission, say in the uh, layer two or layer one, which is defined as CAN, everything was according to the CAN's protocol. So we're actually following the protocol. All we're doing is just. Injecting right, so the right message. So that leads me to my key question, which is, um, you can, you could. I mean, it's related to the question of the first uh, of the colleague. You could really play babbling idiot mm. and really, you know, just transmit 
you know, and shut the whole thing down, which is unavoidable on a bus. So why go to all that trouble? So, uh, as I have said, um, existing IDSs and defense schemes... But you stopped the bus, so, you know, <laughs> the IDS... <laughs> You stop the IDS also, I mean, you stop the bus, you flood the bus so nothing works, the car stops. True, so true. Why but go to a more sophisticated attack if you can do the same thing with a very simple attack, which is babbling idiot? So with the babbling idiot, you would have tons of messages being flooded on the in-vehicle network, as I, as I answered to the previous question. And then you stop, the car stops. That's right, but for existing schemes, you, they try to prevent that or detect that by just looking at that high frequency. But if we remain in the scope of that normal frequency, then we can achieve this, even though those prevention schemes or detection schemes are there. Yeah, but, but you see, uh, I'm sure you're aware of previous projects, you know, earlier on, they have, you know, you know TTP, TTA for time trigger systems, can it die for can, they dealt with that. So, but that was accidental. So, you know, they have counter battling idiot uh, devices, mm -hmm. which really detect the misbehavior, but it's accidental. So they can, oh, it's this guy, he's not behaving well. Yeah, it, it will shut it sit down because it's in the circuitry. Here we're talking about an attacker, a malicious attacker, who took control of an ECU. You see, so nothing can be done in a bus. So I agree with you, something must change in the, in the bus architectures. Yeah. But I think that there are no countermeasures possible. If, if, if you take over an ECU and can actually reprogram stuff that makes you know, the bus go down, then you know, it's all it takes. I, I, you see, the point is, is, is that your trick is really neat, but with that threat model, I mean, if, if now we think of a weaker threat model where you can take over an ECU, where you cannot modify things but could do something stealthy, that I would believe you. But it seems to me that with your threat model, you might as well flood the bus and that's it. But anyway, this is very interesting, okay? So all right, thank you. Get okay, let's take a break. Thank you very much. Let's uh, thank all the three speakers and come to the session today.